Oh, and uh, it's so nice that you're all here uh, this morning. And I, I just wanted to quickly find out because uh, yeah, it's early in the morning. <laughs> and uh, what triggered you to come here for this exact theme? Can I just get some ideas of restart? Why oh. it triggered you to come? <laughs> or are you come for the coffee? <laughs> no, coffee is always good. Yeah. Um, no, I feel uh, I'm a little bit. Uh, Five years uh, as a self employed uh, designer. I feel I'm a little bit on the point uh, how to go back, how to go further, yeah. uh, what form, and, and so on. So okay, I think, uh, nice. that fits the theme uh, well. Okay, yeah. nice. And one other thought, maybe what triggered you to be here this morning? Give me <laughs> yeah. oh. uh, Also, we start. Um, I've been a stage designer and uh, a long time ago, and an artist. And I've worked as a counselor in between, and uh, we started my um, artwork uh, again, and that that is a struggle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah so we're here for the joint struggle. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can relate to that, and uh, I think that's why Claudia asked me. Uh, if you look at my CV, I, uh, I I did a lot of things. I restarted many times in my life. Uh, and for me, restart has to really do with uh, with uh, maybe hitting rock bottom, you know, to, to fall really deep and then to get up on your feet again and to restart. And actually, uh, rock bottom for me became the solid foundation on which I rebuilt my life. And I don't know if it rings a bell. <laughs> it was not my quote. It's J.K. Rowling's. Uh, she also thinks that... Uh, yeah, through struggle and restart, she, she made eventually your success. And uh, that quote could have been mine. <laughs> I'm not a writer. I'm definitely not published a Harry Potter series. But uh, I had some big ideas, very big ideas. And um, I, I'm just thinking now um, the, the presentation <coughs> that I have is rather personal. And I just um, want to share some uh, restarts that I experienced with you. And it's both on a personal as on a professional level. And hopefully you can relate to it. Uh, because uh, I'm a serial restarter. <laughs> and I think you can relate to that. Because I see myself as a creative entrepreneur. Uh, I create like you. We create often something out of nothing. Uh, in my case, it is uh, I create initiatives uh, that are not there. And I see the need for it. And I start to build on those uh, initiatives. Um, and for you, it might be uh, design or photography or theater that you create. And I think especially creative entrepreneurs, they have, um, well, you need to have the skills of a normal entrepreneur, like uh, being strategic, uh, handle your finances, uh, have the skill to sell, to sell your product or, or service. Uh, next to that, you also have to be very like a master in creative thinking, in uh, imagining. Uh, so, so that is on top of that. And to finalize that, we tend to all be very sensitive people, very passionate, very uh, engaged. You give yourself like uh, over 100%. So if you put all those ingredients, uh, you actually have the recipe for quite a rocky lifestyle. Also, to live a creative life can be, uh, yeah, can be confront confrontating and challenging. But I also believe that, especially us, like creative people, we also have this, um, yeah, these abilities that make us uh, also excellent restarters. So I want you to reflect on your your own, uh, yeah, challenges while. I'll 
uh, take you through my story. Uh, one of the things that really, really can bring you rock bottom is death, uh, death of a loved one. And I experienced that. I had a very uh, close relationship to my dad, and uh, after uh, a sick bed, he died. So that was really, of course, a moment in life when you hit rock bottom. Um, I also had an enterprise with somebody else. I had a business partner. And it went really well, but after all, we didn't align anymore and we actually got into fights about how to take the business further. So that also uh, meant something <coughs> that we had to stop collaborating and go separate ways. And that also felt like a new start. I will go into this uh, later to tell you how I, uh, yeah, how I uh, managed to restart after these experiences. Um, I also lived in a very nice neighborhood in uh, Rotterdam, where I also had my first business, was a gallery. And uh, until we discovered that the, the, the ground that it was built on was highly toxic, so we had to be evacuated really from one moment to the next, <coughs> because when they discover and there's a threat to your health, you, you have to be evacuated. So that was also a moment that really yeah, needed needed me to rethink, uh, rethink a lot of things. Um, I also was in a long-term relationship and until I fell in love with someone else, uh, like completely unexpected, and that relationship uh, that I had for over 12 years, uh, yeah, we broke up. So that was also a moment that really affected my uh, private and also professional life. Um, I also run uh, an NGO, you might have heard about it, it's Music Mayday, it doesn't exist in the Netherlands anymore. Uh, and it was really a nice organization, working with young entrepreneurs, creative entrepreneurs in Africa, doing a lot of nice, uh, <coughs> nice and, and interesting projects, uh, until there was a budget cut, and a major donor decided to not fund us anymore, and I had to close down uh, the operations. That also meant uh, a yeah, big deal to the people involved and also for me. And then, uh, in the end, I, uh, yeah, in the meantime, my life went on. And I was, uh, I was 40 and I was single and my relationship broke up. Uh, and I had no job at the time because, uh, yeah, like I said, my previous work with the NGO also finished because of the, the, the budget cut. And I fell pregnant of somebody I hardly knew. <laughs> so that definitely was also a moment in my life that I had to yeah, rethink what to do. Uh, so if you think about it, life is one big restart. And uh, you might feel the same if you really think about life-changing moments or when you hit rock bottom. Uh, life is uh, a constant learning, at least to me. And I want to take you through the examples and hopefully also inspire you with some books I read about that learning uh, that really also inspired me and hopefully you. Um, to deal with loss, uh, when you really are devastated by loss, um, to me the biggest learning, especially after it happens, is to be present. So, so to be present in the now uh, is, was really important because I always spent a lot of quality time with my dad, also when he got sick. And actually, I didn't tell you that in the beginning, but death unfortunately uh, had a big role in my life because uh, only recently I also lost two of my close friends who are my age. Uh, yeah, they also died uh, the past few years. And, but I, I felt like I spent so much quality time with them because I realized we're living here and now. Uh, when you experience loss, you might recognize that, that you, 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 you are so grateful for the time you have here on earth. That it's a big life lesson, of course, to learn and to be present and also uh, to mourn. Uh, I think when you live in the present and something bad happens to you or something de devastating, you are better equipped to restart because you know that you actually experience really the value of the moment. Um, I don't know if you know the move, it's a short animation, you know that? I see uh, you know it, it's called Father and Daughter. 
It's an award-winning uh, animation. It's a bit too long to show you now, but I would uh, Google it. It's a really beautiful animation. It's about eight minutes. And it tells the story about a girl and her father. And of course, that uh, yeah, it was very moving for me to see. Uh, her father died, and he drifted, symbolically drifts off with a boat. And uh, during her complete life, she actually passes the spot where she saw him last, where she lost him. And she's looking out of the water, and you, you can feel the grief. But also that she's not really moving on. You see her every year, every year getting older and looking out of the water and trying to figure out what happens, actually. And then uh, it's only in the moment where she sees the remains of the boat when the tide is out that she walks towards it, and for me, symbolically, that means that she really indulges her in the, in the grief, in the morning, and takes time to be in the present, and to take time to, yeah, to get over this. And only when she has done that, when she really took the time to grieve, then, this is my interpretation, eh? it's, it's a bit open, uh, so you can see for yourself. And only then, she can run to her father, and it's beautifully done, when she walks, you will see the time changes again into her being a child. Uh, only then she is able to really let go and restart. Uh, so for me, it's a very beautiful, uh, beautiful way of symbolizing it. I also thought of books that made a difference when I read them. Uh, you probably there will be books that I show you that you have also read. Edward uh, Tolles, The Power of Now. We really stresses the fact that we shouldn't, uh, yeah, shouldn't get stuck in negative thoughts about the past or the future. So to really live in the now, and I think that's an ancient message that you also find in Christianity or Buddhism or Hinduism. So I think you know, there must be some truth in it. And it's not for uh, nothing, I think, that uh, mindfulness and yoga are now uh, yeah, attractive to us because we find the benefits of living in the now. And there's also a book of uh, Otto Schramer and co-authors, uh, it's called Presence. And that's interesting if you want to restart uh, with your team, because where uh, Toda says you should not dwell in the past, it would be a negative thoughts or in, uh, or in the future. Um, uh, Otto Schramer and co-writers say like, well, if you live, are you consci consciously living in the here and now? Makes it frees your mind, and you will be able, uh, you will be better able to envision in a positive way what could happen in the future. So, for imagining, it's very important to, to bring yourself in the space of the here and now to restart. Um, I also told you about <coughs> the fact that uh, we lived on toxic ground. Uh, I had a gallery. And we were in the middle of this. Uh, it, it took years to, to, um, yeah, to rebuild that neighborhood. So what we did, uh, because I could have, you know, keep struggling with my gallery in, a, in an area that was not attractive for visitors to come by. So what we thought of was like, okay, you know, we're now in this mess. Nobody's coming anymore. So let's try to flip things around. So what we actually did was saying like, okay, we're going to expose our artists on the scaffoldings of those buildings. And this was already, yeah, I don't know which year that was, I can't even recall, like maybe 2000, I think, the year 2000, so it's a long time ago, so sorry for the pixel <laughs> quality of the photos. Um, I found this old one. But, um, so, and that made all the difference. Here you see me. <laughs> Attaching one of the one of the artworks on the scaffoldings with the with the people helping us, and um, that was our gallery. And uh, from a, you know an, an area where like a no go area, uh, we we became like a hotspot in town. There were also always art parties. Uh, we were always you know have outside, inside, and yeah, friends came by, artists came by, collectors came by, and. It, it proved to be really a good thing to flip things around, to restart. And uh, in that sense, 
my uh, my business partner Kevin Randani, who's actually here, that I have the Brainworks Academy with now. Uh, he introduced me to this way of thinking. It's uh, it's called Blue Ocean Strategy Thinking, and you must know it. <laughs> and so you do. Uh, so basically, it says you can keep fighting your your competitors uh, until the sea is red of blood, or you can look for your own uh, little blue spot of ocean and. That is, I think, uh, yeah, a very uh, valuable way of thinking that you're looking for uh, new, inspiring ways that you, yeah, you, you make advantage of your disadvantage. In my, uh, in my case, I did. Um, be joyful. Um, it's very important. Um, I told you about my gallery, and also I had that. I, I run that together with a business partner, and it went really well until we couldn't align our strategy anymore and it felt like you know when you have a business together probably some of you have business partners it feels like a marriage you know you, you are so dedicated in making this work it goes a lot of time and effort in it money in it so when that doesn't work out anymore it feels like a marriage breaking down so that happened to us you know we, we got into real heavy discussions we couldn't align anymore so in the end, we had to go separate ways. So that was the end of the gallery. <laughs> and um, I got stuck in very negative thoughts. I was really, it felt like a burnout. Later on, I discovered that I, I must have felt like, like a burnout because I was so disappointed in myself, in my business partner, <coughs> I felt hurt. Uh, it took me a, really a long time to recover from that until somebody says like, Stop caring so much, you know. And then uh, she took me out on a, on a night out with friends, and we I think we got a little bit drunk. And I I realized like yeah, you know sometimes you you gotta leave things behind and and actually not give a fuck. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you read this book. Uh, it's also very very uh, funny book. I think uh, the point that the author. Is trying to make is to um, is to provoke us of, of not uh, to provoke us not to be positive all the time. You know, uh, we tend to be very positive people. We're creative. You always see opportunities, etc. But but he argues that by being positive all the time and to care about everything uh, and try to fix it, um, yeah, you don't become uh, per se a happier or more balanced person. There, are, it's important to give a fuck, <laughs> but be sure to to determine what you care about. You know, sometimes you don't have to care anymore, and you've got to move on. So that is what for me. Um, yeah, really helped at that moment to not dwell in that past that we've seen before with uh, Tola, but to move on and to not care so much for what happens. I've learned my thing, she learned her thing, we go separate ways and it's, it's fine. So I made a fresh restart after that. Um, I, told, I also told you about my relationship, right? I had a boyfriend for over 12 years, we lived together in, in one house, uh, it was all, all very nice, very loving, very caring, until I, I, yeah, I fell in love with someone else. And that is, uh, that it can happen, <laughs> I don't know. And uh, it can be very, uh, it can be a threat. So, so I had two choices, like either uh, tell or lie about it. And uh, I decided to tell and I decided to be true. And, and there's nothing more scary, I think, than being true to yourself. Like, am I going to continue this relationship or not? Or what, you know, and to be true to somebody else. Um, I, uh, for me, it, it made me capable of restart, knowing that I had been honest with myself. It, it was not easier yeah, because also, um, after you've been together with somebody for such a long time, he was always supportive of <coughs> what I did, etc. I fell in love with that other person. I already knew that wasn't gonna work out like in a long-term relationship, but I felt like no, I can't really go on uh, the way I did. So I decided to be true with myself and left. Um, that was when I moved from Rotterdam to Amsterdam, and 
Uh, I remember that I really felt so bad. I was there uh, by myself. <laughs> I made the choice, but it wasn't <coughs> like I was completely happy at that time because I really felt lonely after 12 years of uh, caring and eating together. And there I was in the middle of Amsterdam and uh, free uh, to do whatever I want, but I felt like a bit lost. But uh, honestly, uh, the fact that I had been true to myself and him uh, made me able to restart quite quickly after a few months of, uh, <laughs> of uh, yeah, kind of uh, lost feeling. Um, and there's a very interesting uh, book about lying. Uh, I don't know if you know this one of Sam Harris. And he really explains the art of lying and actually he, he argues that um, lying is... Uh, yeah, it's, it's like a, it's not it's not healthy because the other one expects you to be truthful and you cannot uh, answer that by lying and then automatically there's a disbalance in expectation <coughs> and, and, and hurt. So uh, it's just I think a good a good way of living to be honest to yourself. Uh, I like to be lied to on the other hand by. Creators. There is a very uh, nice quote of Stephen King, uh, fiction is the truth inside the lie, because when I go to the movies, or when I go to a play, or when I read a book, uh, please lie to me, you know, make, tell me things that are not true, because, you know, my imagination can take me away with your imagination, and that's, to me, interesting that he says this, because in a way it's also lying, right, to tell you that there's a uh, a platform where <laughs> you can catch a train and go to uh, go to a castle uh, to 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 be taught wizard wizard stuff etc. But um, that's a whole other way of lying, of course, than the lying that I was talking about before. And I think you're better equipped uh, when you're uh, able to not lie to yourself. Um, when I was working for an NGO, uh, like the NGO that was uh, helping uh, youth in Africa to develop themselves, we had, uh, we had a lot of uh, places uh, in, in cities like Dar es Salaam, uh, Addis Ababa, Johannesburg, where we, where we actually built youth centers uh, where they could you know, be trained in music, dance, theater and also creative entrepreneurship. So it was very uh, innovative what we were doing and we also organized big concerts simultaneously in different cities, also in Amsterdam, because the thing is well, uh, fundraising came from this side and we gave it to the partners in Africa to uh, organize all kinds of things for you. You see how quiet they sit here and that's what they were used to back in the day. Uh, that they had never experienced uh, a concert like this, so they all sat very quietly on the ground. It was really funny. <laughs> but um, um, uh, when the budget cut came, you have to imagine that all these people, they were so excited with our projects, and all the, you know, they, they really <coughs> felt part of the world through our programs, and then I had to tell them, like, you know, guys, it's over. Um, and it's actually because of the flexibility of the local teams, this is uh, the, the team at the time in Ethiopia, um, that they were able to adapt to this new circumstance. So uh, before they, they had money coming in, they had to develop projects and execute them. Now they had to shift minds, like, okay, money is not coming in, what do we do now? So actually they needed to be more entrepreneurial and also build capacity among themselves to fundraise locally. And right now, as of today, uh, Music Made in Ethiopia is still alive, which is, I think, a beautiful thing. And it's all because of them being flexible and agile. And of course, this is a Bible for many, the lead star. It, it's the, that way of constantly, uh, Kevin and I often <laughs> laugh about it like oh we need to pivot <laughs> because that is also to restart every time anew you try something you have your assumptions and you find out if you're totally wrong you have to go back to the drawing table and rethink and actually restart in in your design or in your idea so uh, this is definitely an influence uh, I, I cannot imagine 
setting up a business or an in initiative anymore without thinking lean and to you know shift uh, in time to new needs or new demands. Um, yeah, and then finally, I, sorry, I forget about the time. <laughs> I have no clue where I am at the time, I'm sorry. <laughs> but this is the last thing that I want to share uh, in that sense with you uh, about the setbacks. Um, I told you that I was in my early 40s and I felt pregnant while I had no job. Uh, the, the NGO in Holland, yeah, we had to close down office so the local partners could go on, but I was out of work. Basically, um, I had a very small house in Amsterdam with only one bedroom. Uh, I knew that the father would not be around <laughs> to help. So, you know, I really felt very um, yeah, lost again and I had to rethink what I would do. So uh, uh, I called a few friends and actually they reassured me to, yeah, you can do that. You know, we know you now, you're 40. Uh, we've seen you through life, you, you can manage this by yourself, we, we will support you. And I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> so I called the, the, the father, you know, because I really felt he should know too. Um, and also important for my child to know where she's from, <laughs> eventually. Yeah, he was totally in shock, of course, as well, because he was living in Dar es Salaam. Uh, and I was calling from Amsterdam like, hey, <laughs> something happened the other <laughs> The other time that I visited. Um, so we both realized, like, yeah, you know, that we are not relationship material, <laughs> but we want this to, uh, yeah, to work out well. So he also supported me in, yes, you know, if you want to do this, I will give you my support and I will acknowledge the child. So here we are. <laughs> and uh, I cannot think of, you know, if I hadn't made that restart, this beautiful creature here and then she wouldn't have come into this world and I think um, I was thinking like is there a book <laughs> there's no book but this is the <laughs> 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 I'm writing my own book <laughs> because uh, I can't think of a book that really helps me I, I, I founded the good family also a platform for parenting I was very much into uh, sustainability and actually, you know, it didn't work out. So what I invented, the platform, it didn't work out for me. So it has its followers. Those are people who bake their own bread, uh, you know, grow their own food and are really, really very good. <laughs> but, you know, in my life as a single mother, a serial entrepreneur, Kickstarter, uh, sometimes I just want to go to the supermarket and, you know, uh, so that is also one of the inspirations uh, for me now to work for Ashoka. It's a network uh, to support social entrepreneurs. Uh, and I see so many great initiatives of uh, biodegradable plastics. And so, so I'm like, yes, yes, invent that and scale it so I don't have to worry about it anymore. And I can go to the supermarket and live sustainably because I do think that's uh, important. But convenience is as well. Um, yeah, and, and right now I'm working for, uh, for uh, Brainworks, which is uh, a company that helps creatives to actually kickstart their careers or, or rebuild them. So uh, in that sense, I'm, I'm, I feel like I've arrived at the right spot because that is where I can uh, maybe add some value. Uh, and uh, I want to leave you with this. Uh, and hopefully you, when you leave, you rethink your own moments. And I also want to, you know, be proud of us because uh, I think creative people have exactly those uh, skills that are needed to restart. And in the end, uh, honest comes good. <laughs> Everything will gonna be okay. So it's never too late to restart. So this was my story. <laughs>